नमस्कार सब हम इन्विटेशन प्रेस कन्फ्रेंस को इन्विटेशन स्वीकार कर मीडिया को सब जान साथी धीरे धीरे नमस्ते अभी स्वागत है गुड आफ्टरनून एवरी वन वेलकम टू द प्रेस कन्फ्रेंस दैट मार्क्स द एंड अफ द डे एंड अफ द इलेवेन डे विजिट अफ द यू एन स्पेशल रैपोटर ऑन एक्सट्रीम पॉवर्टी एंड ह्यूमन राइट्स वॉम वेलकम टू ऑल अफ यू Uh, this conference is happening just to let you know uh, in the at the human house and to all the viewers who are watching us live on zoom and facebook um, we have uh, access to simultaneous interpretation in english and nepali both here in the room and also online on zoom as well so you can access that uh, clicking the buttons there Professor Oliver Deskato and his team have been in Nepal since November 29 to examine the government's efforts to alleviate poverty in the country. During his mission, the special rapporteur visited four provinces: Bagmati, Karnali, Lumbini, and Province Two. He met with nine ministries and. especially with including six ministers as well as local and provincial authorities and people affected by poverty civil society organizations and developing cooperation and un agencies today he is presenting the preliminary findings of his official visit as well as his recommendations to the government his final report will be presented to the human rights council in june 2022 The end of mission statement of the visit to Nepal will be posted online during the press conference, as well as we we'll also will be sharing the press release on the queue in English and Nepali language both. Um, you will find them on the Special Rapporteur's website, srpoverty.org. After Professor Deskuto's presentation, we will be opening the floor to all of you uh, for your questions, and also in the Zoom. So if you have any questions, you can already. Right in the chat box in Zoom. Um, now over to you, Professor. Many thanks indeed for this introduction and very warm welcome to all. Many thanks for being here. I have been appointed by the Human Rights Council to report on poverty in the world, and I um, am very delighted that the government of Nepal has agreed to cooperate with the UN human rights system by inviting me to this visit which started on 29th of November and which is closing today i benefited from a very uh, good level of cooperation from the government of Nepal i was able to meet with some nine ministries during my stay in the country including uh, through discussions with six um members of the of the government six ministers uh the minister of women children and senior citizens the minister of urban development the minister of federal affairs and general administration the minister of health and population the minister of land management cooperatives and poverty alleviation and the minister of labor employment and social security i met also with the attorney general with um members of the federal parliament with six of the 13 constitutional commissions that the country has put in place the tabu commission the indigenous nationalities commission the madeshi commission the muslim commission the national dalit commission and the national human rights commission in addition to meetings i held in kathmandu i met with a number of communities in community in kathmandu but also in other parts of the country I was in Karnali province um where I met uh, near the town of Surket with uh, landless Kandarva and the Badi community I was in Lumbini province where I met with um, uh, Tahu indigenous community members um nearby Badia um I spoke to the local government in uh, Nepal Ganj and then I was in province number 2 um where I could have meetings with Dalit Madeshi women and um semi bonded uh, laborers from the Musaha group I would like to thank all those who could facilitate these um, meetings and all those who uh, could um uh, meet with me during this visit I would like now to present the key findings from that visit um and the first um, finding is that 
clearly Nepal has made significant progress in its fight against poverty. The indicators, whether they concern multidimensional poverty or other socioeconomic indicators, are all improving in the country. And that is, as such, a quite remarkable achievement given the challenges that this country faces. As a landlocked country, a country that has gone, gone through um, civil uh, strife until 2006, a country that has uh, borne um, the um, impacts of the earthquake in 2015, and of course, like others, has been suffering from the COVID-19 pandemic leading to uh, um, um, a number of migrant workers from Nepal losing their jobs in the countries where they were employed. However, behind this general progress, there are certain gaps that remain. Not all groups have benefited equally. And I have been particularly struck by the situation of the Dalit, who represents some 13.6% of the population according to the 2011 census by the Adivasi Janajati, including the Taru population, the Madeshi, um, the Muslim, and um, across all communities, women. I would like to highlight two issues in particular that concern those disadvantaged groups. The first issue concerns access to land, and that is, of course, of particular importance to the landless or land poor Dalit and indigenous nationalities. These groups um, very often have experienced difficulties in obtaining the land ownership certificates that are so crucial in order for them to have access to loans and thus to be able to start businesses as, as self-employed entrepreneurs. Um, they also have sometimes occupied land for many years without being able to obtain a title recognizing the ownership of land, despite the promises made under the 1964 Land Rights Act. Under the Constitution, landless Dalit, referred to by Article 40, Paragraph 5 of the Constitution, as well as former bonded laborers whose rehabilitation is prescribed under Article 51 of the Constitution, should be able to benefit from land reform, from um, being attributed land um, on, which to, on which to work and um, um, from which uh, they can uh, start um, businesses. However, this um, land redistribution process is um, not proceeding apace despite the efforts of the National Land Commission. Um, um, the, pop the populations that should benefit um, have sometimes been waiting for many years for this process to, um, to be implemented. And I would encourage the government to invest even more efforts into accelerating this um, process. The second issue relating to these disadvantaged groups has to do with the very interesting reservations policy that has been put in place in order to um, um, implement this principle of an inclusive society um, that um, is uh, promised by the Constitution. The reservations policy um, provides, as you know, that um, one part of the positions in the civil service shall be set aside for these disadvantaged groups, as defined in Article 18, Paragraph 3 um, of the Constitution. However, this um, set aside, this reservations policy, is facing today a number of challenges. First of all, because the constitutional promise is not fully implemented yet, although, of course, the um, Civil Service Act of 1993 has been um, amended in order to make room for this reservations policy, some groups still remain very far behind. Women have significantly benefited from this policy, this is less true for the Dalit, for example, uh, though they should be recognized 8% of the 45% um, uh, positions set aside. Today, the representation of the Dalit in the civil service has barely improved since before the reservations policy was launched in 2007. Um, secondly, there is a real challenge in combating at the same time 
horizontal inequalities between groups and vertical inequalities between people with different levels of wealth or income. And the verdict adopted by two justices of the Supreme Court on 1st of August is a verdict that shall um, provide an opportunity to rethink the reservations policy in a way that ensures that the promises of the Constitution are kept. I make in my statement uh, two recommendations to that effect. First of all, to take seriously the question of intersectionality and maybe to rethink the reservation system so that rather than benefiting separately the Dalit, the Madeshi women, the system put in place take into account the specific um, um, needs of um, Dalit Madeshi women or women with disabilities, for example, to have, if you wish, a recognition of this intersectionality in the way the reservation system is organized. And the second recommendation is that beyond the 45% positions in the civil service that are set aside for disadvantaged groups, that um, a, a specific set aside be provided um, for the benefit of people of low socioeconomic status, people from poor backgrounds um, that uh, perhaps uh, should also be addressed uh, by this reservations policy. I also would like to remark that reservations, uh, quotas, affirmative action are not a substitute for doing even more to remove the background causes of exclusion that result in the Dalit, the Madeshi, um, uh, the Adivasi needing reservations in order to have access to positions in the public service. Um, these are groups that have um, sometimes limited access to quality education because of the hidden costs of education and because of early child marriage. These are groups that suffer from professional segregation and from social discrimination. These background causes of their exclusion should also be addressed and a reservations policy, however ambitious and well-designed it is, is not a substitute for addressing these causes of exclusion. I turn now to the poverty alleviation efforts that are developed, particularly under the leadership of the Ministry of um, Land Management, Cooperatives and Poverty Alleviation. And I'd like to seize the opportunity to thank Minister um, Shashi Shresta for her efforts in this regard. We have been following very closely the efforts to identify across the country the families that are below the poverty line, defined according to the proxy means test methodology uh, of the World Bank as families where um, the members have less than 22,190 rupees per year per person. And as you know, this mapping of poverty in the country has now been finalized from some, for some 26 out of the 77 districts of the country. And efforts are continuing. I note with interest that this mapping of poverty should be completed by the end of 2022. This will allow to attribute poverty cards to families below the poverty line with 100% subsidized access to the National Health Insurance Program and access to subsidized food items. However, this effort, however commendable it is, is extremely um, costly and may not have um, a lasting impact for one very simple reason. The updating of the data is going to require continuous efforts that will be very difficult to um, maintain. The database should ideally be a dynamic one, allowing to identify families that graduate from poverty, that escape from um, extreme poverty, as well as families that fall into poverty as a result of certain um, health issues, a loss of job, or indeed a natural disaster. And this is a fast changing society in which the dynamics of poverty are extremely important. Um, having a database identifying families below the poverty line is not a substitute for having an integrated social registry that captures all the population and is dynamic 
in the way it uh, collects the data. Let me say now a few words about what was at the heart of many discussions we held in the country, which is the system of social protection that is being put in place. I'd like to make um, a few remarks on the general approach of the country and then focus on one program in particular. At the general level, let me note that the country has a large number of social protection schemes. I counted 76 schemes. Someone told me there are 80 such schemes in place at federal and provincial levels. And of course, this per se represents an enormous challenge to ensure adequate coordination and complementarity. The results of the proliferation of schemes that are often adopted based on political expediency considerations or based on budgetary considerations alone is that people are confused as to what they have a right to, under which conditions, and that economies of scale are not easy to achieve between the different schemes that are put in place. This is why the government may need to give greater priority to the adoption of an integrated social protection framework, as discussed under the National Planning Commission with the social protection task team involving, for example, ILO, UNICEF, and the World Bank. This would allow a streamlining of the different social protection schemes. It would allow the schemes to be improved and become more adaptive to shocks, including those related to to climate um, disasters. It would allow an improved coordination across schemes and across different levels of government. I was struck in my conversation by the fact that as a result of federalization, there was some confusion sometimes as to whom was, was responsible for what in the area of social protection. The federal level, the provinces, the local governments do not always agree on whom should take which kind of action. So the integrated social protection framework should improve clarity. And that is an essential condition for people to be um, well positioned to claim their rights. Access to social benefits starts with an adequate and clear information being provided to beneficiaries as to under which conditions they can benefit, um, as to when they qualify and as to the recourse mechanisms they have a right to if they are denied access to certain schemes. Let me also note that the schemes in place um, um, are limited in their impact due to three structural factors. First, the overall budget of social protection represents some 4% of the GDP and some 11% of the public revenue of the state. And that is a significant effort that Nepal is putting into social protection. I would like to commend the government for this. However, a significant portion of this amount of this budget going to social protection goes to the old age allowance alone, 21%. In contrast, only 4.3% of the social protection budget benefits children. And there is therefore some bias towards um, um, older persons. It is extremely important that people have access to old age pension, and I commend the efforts made in this regard. They should continue, but more efforts even should go into protecting children and other age groups um, in the social protection schemes in place. The second remark I would like to make, and the second limitation the country currently faces, is that for almost all of these schemes, in order to qualify, you need to present um, a citizenship certificate. Yet, many people in the country do not have, in fact, access to these certificates. Although the figures um, are debated, I was told by the Ministry of Health and Population that 5.4 million people, this is one fifth of the country, do not have access to citizenship certificates. And that, of course, is a major cause of exclusion from social benefits. Moreover, as I mentioned, many people are not well informed about their rights. I would recommend that enrollment assistance 
as they already do for the National Health Insurance Program, be deployed across all wards in order to inform families about their rights and in order to encourage families to claim the benefits and to enroll in social protection. Finally, I note that a significant part of the workforce, some 81% of the workforce, about 9 million workers in the country, are informal workers. These workers not only do not benefit from social insurance, they also are excluded from most of social protection and they um, um, are not adequately protected by labor legislation, not least because the country has only 11 labor inspectors to cover all the country, which is significantly less than would be required in order to um, effectively monitor um, compliance with labor legislation, including the minimum wage across all provinces and districts. Finally, let me make a few remarks about one specific program, which is the Prime Minister Employment Program, the public works program that has been deployed since 2018. This program has a significant potential. It can allow people to have access to work um, against cash contributing to improved income security, and it can contribute to strengthen rural infrastructure and um, thus benefit the population as a whole. However, the program as it is currently designed and implemented um, faces a number of challenges, um, and I would like to make six proposals in order to improve it. First, the program needs to be more flexible with respect to um, whom can be employed on the public works um, following registration. Um, I would recommend that when people register with one municipality, they can be employed in a neighboring municipality of the same district if their competences um, allow them to do this and there should be more um, collaborations across municipalities for this to happen. Secondly, the program should have a built-in um, provision for skills building for people to acquire qualifications while being employed on public works. Thirdly, national, um, local governments, municipalities should have greater flexibility in identifying the projects on which people should be employed. And those projects should be more diverse in nature without the focus being, as is currently the case, on road maintenance or um, hard physical labor. Fourth, more resources should go to the program. Today, only about 20% of those who register for the program are actually given work. And when they receive work, it's not for the 100 days that the program should provide, it's for on average 18 to 20 days. And moreover, if they are not provided with work, they do not in fact enjoy the unemployment benefits that should compensate for the lack of work. Fifth, there is some mismatch between the qualifications of um, the candidates and the works that are provided. This goes back to the need for greater flexibility. Sixth and finally, there is a need to improve access of women to the Prime Minister Employment Program. And this could be done by reaching out to women, informing them about the program's benefits, but also improving access to childcare services, which is a problem women face in general in the country in order to improve their access to employment. This is indeed a country which faces a great challenge with respect to women's um, um, empowerment and access to employment in particular, with a gender pay gap that is very important and levels of employment of women that are significantly below those of men. Let me close by thanking again the government of Nepal for its um, collaboration with the United Nations Human Rights System. I will be presenting the government with um, a, a final opportunity to provide comments to the report I will uh, draft based on this visit. The report will be presented to the international community in June um, of next year at the Human Rights Council. In the meantime, these preliminary findings that are now uh, going to be distributed to you 
and that will be posted online, will, I hope, guide the government in its efforts in the next few months. I very much count on the fact that the new census um, um, that uh, will soon be uh, presented, the results of which will soon be presented, will better guide the government's the government in its efforts to um, improve the support to the population. And I feel very much encouraged by what I've seen in Nepal with very impressive commitments of many parts of the government towards improving the situation of the population. With this, I would like to thank you again for your presence and I look forward to receiving your questions. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Vivier, for uh, sharing your preliminary findings. Uh, we have a question we received from uh, Zoom, and uh, on live on Facebook, there aren't uh, any questions so far. So maybe we start with the Facebook uh, Zoom question, and then the floor is open for uh, everyone to present here. So Dilli Duragai is writing. I'm reading exactly what is written. Thank you so much for your views and recommendations. Do you have any recommendation to the government of Nepal on cash transfer as a way to address slash mitigate the impact of shocks, disasters? The government of Nepal seems to be reluctant in this area. Well, thank you very much to uh, Dede Guvajai for this question. Uh, the social security allowance, which is the major cash transfer program in place, um, indeed is one of the programs that could be made more adaptive. And um, that means that it should um, be um, able to react swiftly to the increased social demand for social protection in times of crisis. Now, the crisis can be the result of the COVID-19 pandemic, um, of an earthquake, of a climate disaster, um, and Nepal is a country that is uh, particularly prone, uh, as we all know, to such climate disasters in particular. So I think I welcome this question because it is one of the recommendations I, I, I made concerning the full range of social protection schemes that should be more adaptive. And this requires, um, this requires the ring fencing of budgets to allow um, the social protection schemes to be um, um, to have increased funding in times of crisis. It also requires that we map um, as carefully as possible the households who are most at risk of disasters. And this is what the integrated social registry should allow to avoid having to go from household to household in times of crisis. It would be ideal if these households could be identified before the crisis unfolds in order to provide them with support. So that is what the integrated social registry should allow. And I very much hope this can make progress. Thank you very much, Professor Bukhiba. Now the floor is open for uh, our media friends who are present here. So I start? Thank you. Um, I think you can hear me because I'm just sitting next to you. Um, thank you. It was like really insightful. I think some of the recommendations that we made um, by the government also. So, especially in, in regard to reservation policy, you have highlighted some of the shortcomings that we have. And I think, uh, you know, there have been concerns even within our country. Uh, a section of people feel that even within that particular <coughs> class group that we have allocated this reservation uh, seats, there has been like elite capture. Only the people in the higher HLEM, they have been able to make it to the post. For example, look at in the bureaucracy, who gets passed in the Lok Seva exam, uh, the Public Service Commission exam is, is, is you know, normally people, those are already in the higher HLEM of that particular class group. So there's a debate going on whether it should be based on class or caste. Of course, caste is there, but even within that particular class, there has to be class division, like economic indicators of guide. Maybe you'd be talking on some aspect of this in your recommendation. That's my comment. Uh, and the next one is the citizenship issue that you talk about. I think this is highly controversial issue, even in our country. Like, government has already repeatedly refuted this one. Yeah, of course, there are issues like uh, those who had um, citizenship by, uh, who had received citizenship by birth, and those who were born here, and they have certain complications. 
Um, but you know, I don't know whether this this figure is that that large. Obviously, there are some issues and there are debates going on, like you know whether the children, um, you know, the, whether they can acquire citizenship in the name of their mother. That is also debate, and hopefully, that some legislations are being drafted that will be addressed. Um, you know, you talked about all these things, but do you also have any recommendation? Because you know, our country has you know very scarce resources. I, the resources that we have are barely enough to meet the recurrent, recurrent expenditure of the government. And even to implement that prime minister's employment program, we have to take you know loan from the World Bank. So that is what we are doing. And you know, this way, like what are the suggestions that you know being ourselves a LDC country, although we are in the process of graduating from LDC, but do you also have any recommendation how the government can generate resources to implement all these things? Or you have certain recommendations to the international community to, you know, just you know, increase their support measures. Um, so I stop here. Thank you. Great. Many thanks for these very uh, uh, perceptive and, and important uh, comments that that you made on on three points. Uh, a very brief reaction, if I may. First, I I am of course aware of this um, debate concerning caste-based or, or class-based uh, reservations. Um, when we say caste-based, it's of course um, uh, a shortcut for a much more diverse group also based on you know, uh, nationality, ethnicity. Um, but I think we all understand the terms of the debate. Um, the position I, I have um, on this point informed by my many discussions with um, scholars, academics, uh, but also um, uh, civil society groups, the various constitutional commissions and experts of the topic is that um, it's not an either or situation in which we have to choose between um, um, either a, a class based approach or a class based approach. Um, I think um, we have still um, not overcome the legacy of historic discrimination that certain groups face, such as the Dalit or the Adivasi or the Madeshi. And it is, um, um, in my view, too early to remove um, the specific um, advantages they have in access to. No, I mean, to, to civil service. Group, okay, past group is I, under I understand the question. Thank you. Um, so within those groups, Obviously, those who are best educated, whose family is wealthiest, benefit more than others. Um, to um, address this, I think there are two um, uh, recommendations I make. One is to have um, a, a more um, narrow definition of the various set-asides that the reservations policy could include. So, for example, instead of having one quota for the Dalit, one for Deshi, and one for women, having a quota for the uh, Madeshi Dalit women. And that could be done based on the figures of the most recent census in a way that uh, allows as much as possible the civil service to mirror um, uh, the actual represent, uh, composition of the population. In addition, and here I really respond to this concern, I do think uh, we should think of uh, an additional reservations policy for low income households for the um, um, uh, for those um, with a, a, a deprived social economic background, um, um, who also um, uh, should have a fair chance uh, to compete for access to civil service. Um, um, obviously, this is a never-ending task to ensure that civil service is fully um, representative of the population and gives a fair opportunity to each individual. Um, uh, some will say, well, you know, amongst the um, disadvantaged uh, um, uh, groups of the population who suffer from socioeconomic disadvantages, it's only the best and brightest that will that will succeed in the um, Lofsaba exam, as you as you mentioned. Uh, but I think uh, th that is probably the best we can do. Um, and let me emphasize another point I made, which is that we also should work on the structural causes that explain why the Dalit, the Madeshi, women, others are not able to um, compete on equal terms um, for entrance in the civil service, right? Education, uh, professional segregation, um, social discrimination should be addressed in their own right. And I 
think, for example, that we could seek inspiration from the um, Dalit Empowerment Act adopted in province number two as one example of how we can move beyond existing frameworks. The question of citizenship, you are right, is highly controversial. I fully understand By this. By the way, what was your source of five points of view? Um, the figure was given to me by the Ministry of Health and Population. So on the on the, the, the figures of, of lack of citizenship certificate, right? We understand each other, right? So on this point, I know it's, it's very controversial. I, I, I've been particularly alerted to the situation of children born from women of Nepali citizenship, um, but who married a foreign national or who have an unidentified father. And uh, I'm concerned uh, that uh, without citizenship certificates, uh, a number of uh, social protection schemes are not accessible. Um, it is an issue that I think should be uh, given more attention to um, um, because there is lots of confusion on this issue and, and many real obstacles people face. Um, moreover, there is in the system as it is, um, uh, gender discrimination that still uh, plays a role. And that is, I think, um, uh, easy to address and, and certainly problematic. The third um, remark you made is, I think, equally important. Um, we need resources for economic and social rights to make progress and for the promises of this very progressive constitution to be fulfilled. Um, that means improving the productive capacity in the country. Um, including compensating for a lack of investment in agriculture over the 1980s and 1990s, which has been a neglected sector. It means investing in education and skills acquisition. Um, and I'm concerned that there is no really convincing job creation strategy presented to me by the, by the government. Um, when I asked this question, the answer I received was mostly that the government counts on out-migration and the remittances that can support um, families left behind. That is not a sustainable answer. And actually, I would worry if I were to look at the figures of young adults leaving the country in search of opportunities abroad. Of course, remittances are a good thing if they can support families in need left behind but they are certainly not an answer to the um, development um, needs of the country. And so um, we need more investment in education, in social protection, in um, skills building and in um, professional training in order to strengthen the productive capacity of the country. Thank you. Thank you. Any... Professor, can I ask you a question? You spoke about uh, maintaining a more integrated social protection framework rather than uh, multiple schemes. Any specific, uh, let's say, example you recommend to follow? So, thank you for your question. This is um, a proposal that is on the table of the government since um, three or four years now, and it's an effort led by the National Planning Commission in coordination with a number of um, partners, including um, UN agencies. Um, so the proposal is there, um, and, and it is um, uh, meant to do two things. First, to streamline existing social protection schemes that per se is an effort worth uh, investing because it will provide much needed clarity in what people have a right to. And that I think can significantly reduce the uh, confusion of potential beneficiaries, which explains why many people do not claim their rights uh, since they do not um, know um, what they have a right to, to, to claim. Um, and secondly, it can be an opportunity to rethink some of the schemes in place um, uh, in order, for example, to make them more adaptive to shocks, um, as uh, I already mentioned in response to the question of um, Mr. Uh, Guajai. Um, and thirdly, um, this integrated social protection framework um, should be an opportunity to achieve certain economies of scale. And in particular, each scheme has now its own way of identifying beneficiaries, sometimes its own card, um, we need one comprehensive um, database, 
called the integrated social registry um, that could uh, be used by the different schemes, uh, reducing significantly the administ administrative costs involved in um, um, improving the coverage of the population. Can I ask one more? Sure. Stella, is your mission part of Nepal's graduation to a, um, from the least developed countries? Is it part of that? No, the mission has no link to that process. The process, of course, um, resulting from um, the, the resolution adopted, I think it was on 24th of November by the UN General Assembly, um, is one that will um, be seized, I hope, as an opportunity by the government of Nepal to implement and accelerate um, reforms. The main challenge for uh, the government, um, as I mentioned a few minutes ago, will be to improve the competitiveness of its economy, because graduating from being an LDC may mean that it will be more difficult to obtain certain trade advantages and, and access to foreign markets at preferential conditions. So Nepal has five years to, um, um, to, to succeed in meeting this challenge. Um, I think- uh, Can your recommendations be taken as the guideline? Well, I, I hope the recommendations can, can help. Um, I, I, I would like to emphasize that contrary to a common um, prejudice, investing in the fight against poverty and investing in social protection is not um, detrimental to competitiveness. It is, on the contrary, a way to strengthen human capital uh, by improving the health education of people and thus the uh, productive capacity of the of the economy and especially relevant for Nepal to make the country more attractive to um, the young adults that now are leaving the country in search of opportunities abroad. So I, I do think that um, the recommendations I make uh, can actually support that uh, development strategy of the country. Yes. Thank you. Okay, um, thank you very much. Um, There's a okay, okay, okay. And, and you identified a number of challenges, including COVID that Nepal faced while uh, achieving progress in poverty reduction. But moving forward, do you think that the pandemic risk uh, threaten the progress that it has made or widen or exacerbate the significant gap that you cite to us? Um, well, thank you. Uh, Nepal is not uh, in a unique position in this regard. All countries have um, 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 have experienced setbacks um, as a result of the pandemic. Um, I think in Nepal, quite apart from the um, sanitary challenge and the human costs, of course, involved, um, one impact has been um, school dropouts have increased as a result of schools closing. Very few households, as we know, were able to follow online education if it was provided at all. And um, that um, may have led um, to not only increased rates of school dropouts, but also um, increased um, early child marriage. I don't have data on this. It's probably too early. but. I met many, many young women who, um, you know, married at um, 15, 16 years old. Um, and when you leave school and when your family is facing um, um, a, a new challenge because, you know, one member has lost his or her job or, or the, 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 the factory has, has closed where the parent was employed, um, you are tempted to either marry uh, the, the uh, the, the daughter or to put the child to work. And, and, and it is still a huge challenge, right? Uh, uh, child labor in the country. So um, these are not the sanitary impacts of the crisis. These are the social economic impacts and some of them may be irreversible. If you remove children from schools, if you put them to work, if you get them to marry early, it is very difficult then to, to reverse um, uh, the situation for the for the for the child and and frankly that is that is a life sentence to impose on the child because the consequences will follow him or her throughout his or her adult life so for me it's very problematic okay 
Okay. Um, if nothing from the floor, then I, I have another question here. Uh, what would be your most important recommendation to the Nepali government? <laughs> Well, my most important recommendation would be to follow my recommendations. There's another question here yeah, that you met Dalit indigenous people, women in poverty. What did they tell you? Did they feel supported by the government? It's a complicated question to answer. The reason is that uh, there's a very promising constitution. There's, I think, and that's important, it's the first step, a genuine recognition of the challenge. This is not a country that ignores that Dalit, Adivasi, or indeed women um, still um, um, have not equal chances in the Nepalese society. Um, but many of the obstacles that uh, these groups face um, have their source in, in families, in societies, at you know, community ward levels. And for a government to address this is extremely complicated because it's linked to, to, to prejudice, to social custom, and to um, um, uh, you know, inherited disadvantage that you cannot remove by the strike of a pen, right? Um, it's a challenge many countries face. Um, you know, this is called chronic poverty uh, as opposed to transient poverty. It's called structural um, uh, poverty in some cases, and it is something that requires time to be addressed. Um, I think um, in part, the um, affirmative, action, affirmative action policies in place um, are a way to address this for a simple reason. Um, when people have access to civil service, and indeed, if affirmative action is also developed in the private sector, which I hope it shall, um, the members of the Dalit, the members of the um, Taru or the Madeshi have role models they can compare themselves to. They can be inspired by the achievements of some members of the community, and they can be encouraged, therefore, to invest in acquiring better education and skills. For the moment, for you know, a Dalit, Madeshi woman, um, especially if she has a disability, there's not much incentive in investing in education because of the many obstacles that that person shall face in access to um, well-paid uh, jobs um, um, in, certain, in certain sectors of the economy. So it is a virtuous cycle. If you create those opportunities, you then lead people to acquire the qualifications that will allow them to better seize the opportunities. And I think that is the virtuous cycle we should create. We are not, for the moment, in a vicious cycle. Um, in other terms, we are moving in the right direction, but I think we could do more to accelerate this, um, this process. Thank you very much. There's one more question. Um, so how is your delegation has covered the role of the national institutions, such as constitutional bodies in raising and protection of the rights of the historical excluded communities? Yes, so um, I, I welcome this question. I had the opportunity, as I mentioned, to meet some six uh, constitutional commissions. Um, and I, I, I think it's a very interesting um, uh, aspect of the Constitution that these commissions provide recommendations to the government, forcing the government to see certain issues that it would be more comfortable to ignore. Um, these commissions that uh, do not allow them to really conduct uh, high quality research that could uh, allow them to make even better informed recommendations. Secondly, um, um, there is no duty on the government, nor indeed on the parliament, to follow upon the recommendations. It could be imagined that the government has a duty, if not to follow recommendations, because these are, after all, consultative, not decisional bodies, but at least to provide a reasoned answer 
um, to the proposals made by these commissions, explaining either that the recommendation will be followed or that if not followed, the recommendation um, has at least been studied and, and the government may have a duty to explain itself as to why the recommendation is not followed. Um, and I think this could be a, a next step um, um, in order for the weight of these, rec of these commissions to be um, strengthened in the future. Uh, that leads to another question. So uh, how do you see the intersection of the extreme poverty and the LGBTIQ community? Have you made any recommendations in this regard? No, I'm afraid I have not. I did not have an opportunity in these very busy days to, to meet with representatives of the LGBTI community. Um, um, I regret this. I, 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 I would like to add that my findings are not final. Um, I will work in the next few weeks towards um, preparing the draft report. Um, all stakeholders are welcome to present submissions to inform my views. And the, the draft will be finalized by 1st of March, um, at which time I will present the draft with the government uh, that will have some six weeks to provide its own comments. And then the report will be finalized and, and presented um, as an official report to the UN. So I hope that um, all those whom I could not meet on my uh, visit uh, will be using this opportunity. Thank you very much. Any, any more questions from the floor? Uh, because I don't see any more in the Just chat me. box. Okay, can I add one? Yes. Hello, my name is Ujwal. I just read the Iman and Times newspaper. So it's a good thing that Nepal is developing from LGBT into emerging. <clears throat> I'll stand up about okay. it. So many had upload that Nepal is finally emerging from the LGBT into emerging economy. But, but there are still many people who doubt about this. Uh, you see in Nepal, in the urban cities, like in the capital, there are good paid jobs, but people, people, people are still finding difficult to provide two types of good men, standard men, even in the capital. Right? People are actually living in the poverty. I, I would like to think, think, think in that way personally. And many people would also agree that also, that Nepal's uh, annual budget, 26% uh, per, is contributed by the foreign aids. It is uh, the data provided by the finance ministry. So many fear that after the graduation from the LDC, uh, those financial aids will be cut off. People, people fear in that way. So yes, there are five year, five year, five year transition period for that. But um, since Nepal is fighting for decades uh, in poverty and discrimination, something like that, these five years period will be enough for Nepal. Since you have visited here and met many people, you have visited a remote place and you have discerning knowledge about this. So what's your opinion about this? Um, thank you for your question. I, I think there are different views on this. Thank you. Um, the the statement does refer to the to the problem of um, the country being exceedingly dependent on not only foreign aid but also on remittances from migrant Nepali workers. Um, this is why I mentioned in response to other questions the need to strengthen the productive capacity of the country. Um, at the same time. Um, I, the successive governments of Nepal have been, I think, attentive to limit the growth of the foreign debt and to avoid creating an excessive dependency on foreign donors uh, for certain key sectors, such as education and health. And I think that is um, indeed a healthy approach. Um, so um, that is all I can say. I, as I said, my visit is not related to the graduation process. This is something another part of the UN is responsible for. Um, although, as I also said, I, I do hope my recommendations can 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 help um, maintaining um, the country on the on the right track. Um, just like Nepal is graduating from LDC status uh, to becoming an emerging um, economy. It should now um, uh, graduate on uh, poverty indicators and on human rights indicators uh, to, to match um, 
that economic graduation strategy. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Hidley, for answering all the questions. And thank you, everyone, for coming um, to attend this press conference. We are right on time. Uh, we had scheduled this for until 1, 1 p.m. And we are almost at the end of today's press conference. If you want to uh, have one-on-one -on -one interview, some have already requested for it and have uh, we designated the slot. We have one slot remaining if, if you want an in-person interview with him today. Um, before 4 p.m., please contact me. Um, you are and, pitiless. <laughs> um, and um, the, as, as mentioned before, the press conference, the statement has already been uploaded online. I'll also share with all of you over email. Um, and we have tea and cookies and, being served outside. And the Nepali version. Yeah, both uh, in both English and Nepali version. So thank you very much. Thank you very much.